Okay, folks, welcome back. And this time we're going to look at the Common Gael government, continuing on this time from the army mutiny, going into the assassination of O'Higgins, and then looking into Anglo Irish relations, that would be Ireland's position as a dominion, and also then going on to the whole issue of the Boundary Commission. Okay, the army mutiny will be an, an important topic if there was a question in relation to security, as seen in the 2018 exam papers. It would also work in a general Comla Gaelic question or indeed something to do with W.T. Cosgrave. And you can put this in with the whole issue of law and order and the Gardaí as well. Anyway, as you can see, the Army Mutiny, the title is quite misleading. It wasn't exactly a mutiny per se, more a disagreement between the Comla Gaelic government and the Irish Free State Army following the aftermath of the Civil War. Richard Mulcahy was both Minister for Defence and he was also the Commander-in-Chief of the Irish Free State Army. So his loyalties were kind of tied, I suppose, between two sides. His loyalty to Cosgrave and his government, but also the boys back in the barracks, so to speak. There was also great personal tension between Kevin O'Higgins and him. So he was in a difficult situation here because a lot of the army were a bit annoyed with Cumla Gale for not carrying on Collins's kind of legacy that the freedom to achieve freedom was part of the treaty. In other words, they could build for a republic and many felt that Cumla Gale were not building for a republic at this particular time. So the trouble began in May of 1923 when the decision was made to downsize the army. This was a cost issue more than anything else. And also following the Civil War, there was a, probably a genuine need not to have such a large army. The Irish army numbered about 52,000 men, and that was to be reduced down to 30 and eventually 18,000 men. So it would mean leaving people go. And a lot of these soldiers would have been, you know, loyalists going right back to 1916, going into the War of Independence itself. And then during the Civil War, they would have been pro-treaty on the side of Cosgrave and the Cumla. So the whole issue was about who to get rid of. And this was going to cause a lot of resentment within the various army ranks across the barracks across the a lot of the old ira men were being pushed out and instead being kept on were men who fought in the british army during world war one which militarily may have made some sense but i suppose morally speaking perhaps they felt a bit betrayed by the free state government that they had helped to establish and many felt that they were once again ignoring collins's promise that the treaty was just a stepping stone to achieve freedom then in an effort to try and solve the situation, Mulcahy, the Minister for Defence and in the Commander-in-Chief of the Irish Free State Army, tried to tell those um, soldiers that were being let go to revitalise the IRB, the Irish Republican Brotherhood. But that in itself would be very problematic because then you'd have essentially two armies in the country and Kevin O'Higgins from one was not standing. So the mutiny itself began on the 6th of March 1924 when two officers, Liam Tobin and C.F. Dalton, presented an ultimatum to the Cosgrave government, demanding one, an end demobilization of the army, two, the removal of the army council, and three, that the government would still continue to push for a republic, as Collins had spoken of. However, this was not sitting well with some people. Eventually, Mulcahy would be pushed aside. Also, as well, Ono Duffy took control of the army because he was now made the new commander in chief of the army and began to arrest those that began to rebel against the Free State government. <coughs> The crisis became even more serious with 49 more soldiers resigning by the end of the, the week. And Joe McGrath, the Minister for Industry and Commerce, also resigned in protest and in sympathy with the soldiers. And he actually acted as a go between between the army and the government of the day itself. He felt that they, the men responsible for the foundation of the Free State, were now being badly treated. Cosgrave was apparently unwell at the time and decided not to take part in any of the meetings between the army and the government. Instead, Kevin O'Higgins once again took control of the situation. and He chaired meetings between them, so much so that it, of course, meant that Richard Mulcahy would become the fall guy, as he had lost his position of commander-in-chief and subsequently resigned as Minister for Defence. Within a week, though, on the 12th of March 1923, the or 24, I should say, the um, mutiny came to a conclusion where it was decided that a committee of inquiry would be established between the army itself to look into the whole issue of army administration and personnel. There would also be a whole issue of the army personnel that you know, who would be kept on, who would be hired, who would be fired, and they would also try and be a bit more sensitive in relation. Also, in return, the soldiers would return to their posts with the return of arms removed. And lastly, an army service pension scheme would also be set up and that would be given to all soldiers who served 21 years or more in the forces 
that they would have an additional pension for life along with the state pension when they would retire in their whatever mid 60s whatever it was at that stage so by the end of the ordeal civilian control was assured the army once again swore loyalty to the irish free state and they also swore not to join any secret army such as the irb which effectively brought an end to the irish republican brotherhood in ireland at that particular so after that it was certainly seen as a bit of a wobble for the Cumna Gael government it could go in as part of a paragraph on the Cumna Gael or Cosgrave administration also as I mentioned the question on security it would work for very very well something like the economy and Irish relations it would have no bearings whatsoever in any essay on that a footnote to this really then is the assassination of O'Higgins it's not really vital in particularly in any essay maybe again with the security thing you could just mention it but in June of 1927, Cosgrave had called an election, and this election also saw the emergence of Fianna Fáil. Fianna Fáil had come about the previous year in 1926, when de Valera and others realised that staying outside of the Dáil was simply no longer an effective option, that they would simply have to go in and take the oath of allegiance at some stage and enter the, polit the political uh, form, if you will. The abstentionism of Sinn Féin, which began in 1922 with the fallout of the treaty, was no longer acceptable. De Valera had been campaigning to have the oath of allegiance removed by means of a referendum and trying to gain 75,000 signatures in order to do that. However, he would prove it. A major issue then happened that following month when Kevin O'Higgins was assassinated by IRA men on his way to Mass. And this was a major shock to the state. This was a major blow to the Cumna Gael government and also prompted Cosgrave to act very swiftly and introduce a series of legislation and measures to deal with it. Firstly, a public safety act was granted to the powers, the special powers to the, um, the, the Gardaí, I suppose, and the courts, and also saw the use of the death penalty if necessary for any illicit activities by Republicans, such as members of the IRA. Secondly, he also stopped that, I suppose, attempt by de Valera to call a referendum on the whole issue of the oath of allegiance and changing the procedures and how they would be called. And thirdly, and most importantly, he introduced an Electoral Amendment Act, which essentially forced Fianna Fáil now to take the Oath of Allegiance or else lose their seat at any future. And there you can see a picture of Kevin O'Higgins, the Minister for External Affairs from 1922, Minister for Internal Affairs, I should say, from 1922 up until 1927. This then, of course, as I said, prompted Fianna Fáil to come into Leinster House and to take the Oath of Allegiance. De Valera, Sean Lamass and others were essentially now saying the words with their fingers crossed behind their backs, so to speak, and using the empty formality of saying the oath. A proper election was called then in October of 1927, with Cumla still with the largest share of votes of 62 seats, but coming right behind them now was Fianna Fáil with 57. Fianna Fáil, as I said, had been established the previous year, 1926, and had gained a lot of support from, we'd say, the smaller farmers, which Cumla were seen to be maybe not looking after, and also a lot of the urban working classes in Dublin as well. So they had quite a sprawl right across the country. Okay, we're now taking a significant detour here, and we're going into the whole issue of Anglo-Irish relations, one of the most common questions in this section. Anglo-Irish relations works on a question on Cumla Gael in general, W.T. Cosgrave in general, or you could get something about Anglo-Irish relations from 1923 up as far as 1949. There are two paragraphs here for you on the Cumna Gael government, one on the Boundary Commission and secondly Ireland's position I suppose in the wider world and also as a dominion. So the Boundary Commission is very very important and this is basically a disaster for the Cumna Gael government, a debacle, a fiasco, these are words that are often associated with this whole incident. Under the terms of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, Article 12 stated that the Boundary Commission would be established to essentially look at the north-south border that had been established in 1920 under the Government of Ireland Partition Act. Under the terms of the treaty, it would be a three-person body representing the north and south and a British chairperson to, quote, determine in accordance to the wishes of the inhabitants, the economic and geographical conditions, the boundaries between the north of Ireland and the rest of Ireland. We're back in the treaty. Collins and Griffith had both hoped that this would see large transfers of land back from the north into the south. However, the reality would be somewhat different when it came to the actual whole commission. And this has been kind of kicked down the road somewhat for many years by the British government. Firstly, you had a Conservative government that didn't seem sympathetic to the Irish demands. 
the whole issue of the civil war had dragged on as well into 1923 and there was a lot of political instability as i said and of course the unionists up north were also kicking up about this that they did not want to have any dealings with any bound anyway in 1924 the first labor government was um, established in britain led by ramsay macdonald and he perhaps being a bit more sympathetic to the irish cause finally established the boundary commission this consisted of a British appointed chairperson, a South African judge called Mr. Justice Richard Freedom, and an Irish representative called Owen McNeill. And the Ulsters Unionists refused to have any dealings with it. So instead, the British appointed J.R. Fisher in place of um, Craig itself because they were not having part of it. So the Boundary Commission began its work, and Owen McNeill was appointed to represent the Irish Free State. Perhaps not the best choice for this, as he was not very strong, perhaps, in voicing Irish concerns and demands of the transfer of land back into the South. The commission began its work from November of 1924, and it went on for the following year, the next 12 months. Again, looking at issues like the geography, the economic factors, etc., without maybe taking a proper look into the, I suppose, the cultural implications and political implications of this whole thing. Meanwhile, Cosgrave took his eye off the ball as well and didn't offer much attention to it and protest to it as McNeil was carrying on the work and as I said made man for the job. Anyway on the 7th of November 1925 the Morning Post the British newspaper leaked details that essentially nothing would change in relation to the border and this was to prove to be a disaster causing major panic in Dublin in particular. Cosgrave was pretty much annoyed by this also the suggestion that part of East Donegal would even be transferred back in the north caused major earthquakes down in Dublin and McNeil resigned as a result for his failure I suppose to bring about any real subsequent gains for the South. Cosgrave meanwhile demanded that the Boundary Commission findings be quote burned or buried for fear of public outcry here. O'Higgins took over in place of McNeil and he attended a conference in London in 1925 and the report concluded that the Findings would essentially be suppressed and not made public until 1968, well after all the main uh, participants were essentially gone out of the political fray. Most importantly, the border will remain unchanged, and this was a major disaster for the Free State Cosgrave Cumnagale government. And thirdly, the Irish Free State would be relieved of its liability of the British war debt. They had been paying, I think, two seventeenths of the cost of World War One up until. Also, a joint North-South Council of Ireland would now be essentially abolished and full control would be given to the North. And last, the Irish farmers up in the North would no longer have to pay land annuities to Britain. But this would still continue in Ireland right up until, I suppose, essentially 1938 after De Valera and the Economic War, which we'll look at in the next year. Overall, the Boundary Commission was a debacle, a complete disaster for the South, and it essentially fastened partition in the north and so which remains to this very very day and many republicans were let down by Cumla Gale for essentially giving up on Collins's I suppose hope for Ireland. The unionists of course up north were relieved at the outcome as well and it essentially meant there would be no north-south cooperation between the two states for the next 40 years. Okay we're going to pause there and we're going to continue on with Ireland's role as a dominion and economic policy in the next section.